So today I'm excited because we're going to learn about the history of cedar bark weaving. Uh, we're going to hear some stories and we're going to enjoy some art. Uh, we're going to try to wrap up the main presentations at 1 p.m. So for those of you who are on a lunch break from work, uh, don't worry. We're going to try to wrap up by then. But for those of you who can stick around a bit longer, we will probably stay to answer a few questions from the audience a few minutes after 1 p.m. So if you have some great questions in your mind as we're going through this, uh, just start putting them into the Q&A uh, feature of, uh, of Zoom. Otherwise, you can just plop it into the chat. But it's easier for us to find them if you put them in the Q&A. So now I'm going to introduce today's speakers. So please, can all of you join me on stage? Hello. Great. So uh, Kung Jade is a 2021 Indigenous Storyteller in Residence at VPL. She is originally from the village of Old Masset in Haida Gwaii. She belongs to the Haida, the Musqueam, and the Squamish First Nations. Since 1996, Kung Jade has performed for hundreds of audiences across Canada and the U.S. And through her writing and storytelling, she has taught the Haida language to both children and adults alike helping to preserve and revitalize her ancestral dialect. Her name means Moon Woman. Todd DeVries is a renowned Haida weaver from the Eagle Clan. He practices traditional techniques using Western red cedar bark, uh, Western red cedar bark, to create works of Northwest Coast art, such as traditional and contemporary hats, baskets, bracelets, and more. And then Kriawa Jones is an artist and curator of Nishka and Haida descent. She worked at Bill Reed Gallery for six years to curate and program exhibitions of Northwest Coast art. And she is the guest curator of the Haida Now exhibition that is currently on display at the Museum of Vancouver. Now, for those of you who are right now joining us from Vancouver, I highly recommend you go see this exhibition. It is spectacular. Uh, the museum is beautiful and it's, it, they've taken great uh, measures to make sure that everyone can visit it safely right now during COVID. So go check it out. It's an incredible exhibition. So what we're going to do now is they're each going to do a presentation separately and then at the end we're going to bring them together to do to answer some questions from the audience. So again, if you think of a great question during this uh, these conversations or their presentations, just plop it into the Q&A and we'll get to it at the end. So now let's get started. Uh, first up, we're going to hear from Kung Jade. So I'm going to ask Todd and Kui to leave the stage for now and Kung Jade, um, take it away. Oh, uh, Chen Kwan Man told me, thank you so much. The Lunk Usia Chuga, you are all welcome here. The Lunk Henge Ande Hangelga, it's good to see you all. The Lunk Hatsket La Uslan, you all look really good. And just because I stretched that out doesn't mean that I'm teasing. Gathling uh, a and it's a true story. You all look really good. I am so honored to be here. I'm honored to be the 2021 Indigenous Storyteller in Residence. And um, I want to acknowledge that um, my people, the, the Musqueam and the Squamish, share the territory with the Tsleil-Waututh First Nation. And I'm so honored that we do. This is such a beautiful place. This is only my second year of living here in this territory. And I'm loving it. I'm loving it every day. How ah, Chen Kwan Man told me. I am not a weaver. I, uh, I am wearing some traditional weaving. My youngest child made my headband. And I don't know the artist who made my, um, my shawl, but I absolutely love it. It is in rainbow colors, which I completely love too. Um, I am in awe of weaving. I'm also wearing a raven's tail pouch that I won in a raffle and I commissioned my wristbands from a weaver from Old Masset. She also made my black and white regalia, which is a vest and a dancing apron. I'm not wearing those things today. Um, I guess I am so much in awe of weavers and weaving regardless of what kind of weaving they do. I, um, I was also gifted a beautiful hat, uh, um, a red cedar hat from my cousin who gave me this hat very early on in my storytelling career. And he had it for a number of years. 
it turns out one of my great aunts made this hat. So she's the same clan uh, as me. I didn't explain that um, on the Haida side of my ancestry, I'm Yakolanos Raven clan. So, uh, and I didn't even introduce myself. I'm so excited today. <laughs> My Haida name is Moon Woman. My name was given to me by my cousin, Crystal Robinson, at the memorial uh, potlatch, honoring my great uncle, who was the, the hereditary chief of my clan in August 2008. So Crystal gave me this name when she heard me perform my berry picker in the moon story. And she, um, she thought she had already given me the name and said that I did great honor to my name. I let her know I didn't have this name. And in August, 2008, she came to the potlatch and she told such a beautiful, power, powerful, touching story. I wish, I wish I could recreate it immediately, you know, even if I recorded it, which I didn't think to do, um, I couldn't capture that moment as well as she shared it. Uh, I cried the rest of the night. She expected me to actually tell the story of the berry picker in the moon at that moment, but all I could do was cry because uh, I was so deeply moved. And I remember my Goggy, my uncle Hoya, um, looking at me and smiling and saying, niece, it doesn't get any better than this. And I mean, my Goggy is now in the spirit world. Uh, he helped encourage me to tell stories. I was very shy. I was very awkward, but he um, would just throw me into the deep end every chance he got. <laughs> and now I'm so grateful that he's done so. So one of the things that my cousin did is he gifted me this beautiful dajange, this hat uh, made of red cedar. Um, and uh, that made me cry as well. I cry a lot. I was taught by a Cree elder that tears are a sign of strength. It means you're connected between your head and your heart. Uh, people who cannot cry are not strong, but those of us who are uh, connected between our hearts and our heads, uh, we're so strong that we sometimes cry for those people who cannot. I'm actually okay with that. Um, I, um, I realize we're on different uh, parts of our journey and wherever we are, it's actually okay. So excuse the background. Uh, I'm just realizing I'm on at the central library and uh, they are doing repairs on the roof. <laughs> so I can see there are construction workers walking outside the window. So just look at me, just look at me. <laughs> so right here on the top of my hat, you see a couple of trade beads. I'm trying to focus them, but uh, I guess my camera isn't so good. So there's a red one and there's a blue one. These are uh, trade beads that the Europeans traded uh, with indigenous people. This is an ermine, the winter coat of the weasel. It means that I come in peace. That's what that means. Um, I love my hat. It's starting to wear. I use it a lot. I've used it in the rain. Um, it's unavoidable. When I was on Haida Gwaii, it's very rainy there. I um, I am, I have attempted to weave, I should let you know, I have tried weaving a few times, I'm, I'm okay at it, but I think what happens is I tell myself that I can't do it. I tell myself that I can't do it, but I just had an, uh, a discussion with possibly a new friend uh, who, who told me, he taught me that uh, he looks and says, well, if that person can do it, then I can do it. So I, I know I need to tell myself that if other people can do it, then I can do it too. Uh, and I'm thinking not so much as to make money uh, as I would love to be able to give my family gifts that I made with my own hands, aside from the books that I've written. Um, I guess, yes, I'm a storyteller, I weave words. That's what I do. I weave words and I'm so grateful to do that. So one of the things that I absolutely love, I went to the Museum of Vancouver to see the Haida Now exhibit and it is phenomenal. It's absolutely amazing. Uh, one of the things that I noticed, um, my great, great, great grandparents, uh, Charles and Isabella Edenshaw have their work on display there. So there is a case 
where it's featured. One of Isabella's hats is there with her signature star on the top. Um, uh, my grandfather Charles uh, painted all her hats for her. They were, uh, I think of them as being quite a team uh, and being able to um, share their gifts and uh, actually help one another and support one another for their entire lives. Um, this is quite an inspiration. And um, I'm so grateful uh, to be talking about them because later on I'm going to be telling a story about Isabella uh, for my grand finale because she survived the last smallpox epidemic in 1862. Now, I really would like to give plenty of time for, um, for Kuiwa and for Ishiga today because uh, Kuiwa is an incredible and amazing artist in her own right and she's an amazing curator and uh, I'm very honored to invite you to speak now. So thank you so much, Kuiwa. Oh, hello, King Jade. It's so good to see you. Um, hello, everyone. Um, uh, I'm really happy to see everyone here today from all these amazing places. Like, what a great technology we have to connect uh, all these people across time and space. Um, my name is Kuiwa Jones. I live in the unceded territories of uh, the Coast Salish people, um, <clears throat> but I'm I'm very much a Haida girl and I'll be returning to Haida Gwaii this uh, summer to go harvest food and fish and probably bark and roots with my family. So um, I'm here today to give you like a little bit of an overview, like I'm an artist and a curator. The, the first exhibition I curated in 2008 when I started to put together exhibitions was called From a Few Weavers. Uh, and From a Few Weavers was um, uh, an exceptional show because what it did was highlight the rise of weaving amongst the Haida Nation. So at one time on the coast, through residential school, through the Indian Act, through smallpox, our people were diminished so much that there was only a handful of weavers left. Um, and she wanted to go to residential school and she recalls being a little girl crying on the beach, wishing to go on the steamer to go to school with all the other kids. But her grandparents said, um, no, you're gonna stay home and learn our ways instead. And she was always kind of upset about it, but she really kind of literally missed the boat, which is the reason we have weaving uh, now. So she, <clears throat> learned all this like beautiful ancient technology like weaving and she um uh she ended up getting older in like her her later part of her life and she looked around and realized that nobody was weaving anymore um and people were using ice cream buckets instead of baskets to like pick um uh, berries and stuff. So she, in her sharpness and like her wit, she was able to convince the University of Southeast Alaska to hire her as a professor. And in broken Haida, you know, because she spoke broken English and like spoke Haida first, um, she <laughs> was able to convince them to hire her to teach people how to weep. So suddenly scholars, um, ethnologists, um, uh, curators all started to take these courses and <clears throat> before she started weaving her her uh, baskets and she would sell them for like five dollars a piece uh, and this is like I think in the 70s and uh, and then once these curators and scholars realized how much work labor love and detail goes into this type of basketry uh, a small basket, like the soup can size with a lid, would sell for $5. And after her course, it went up to three to $400 a piece for these baskets because people realized the, the intensity that it took to, to weave anything. And uh, so she ended up teaching for the rest of her life and she passed it on to her daughter. And her daughter, Dolores Churchill, is like a fellow 
um, of like the United States, like she's been honored at the highest level as like an artist to teach. And so her daughter, she's got four daughters, I think, three daughters, and they all specialize in different types of weaving. And it's through this one bloodline, do we have an unbroken thread to weaving? Um, and it's quite remarkable because I know each one of them have like touched not just Haida weavers, but like weavers throughout the Northwest coast. So they learned alley weaving, they learned clinket style, they learned, uh, you know, like uh, Haida style. And, and Haida style is really unique because it's got a Z twist on it. Anyways, it's uh, uh, qu quite a phenomenal story. And through one woman, uh, April Churchill, she's the granddaughter of Selena Parodovic. Uh, she was able to uh, teach weaving so vividly that now when you go into a Haida potlatch, it's absolutely dressed with beauty. So um, anyway, I wanted to tell that story because I think it's important because like one woman can make such a huge difference um, for like this type of, uh, I guess, pedagogy or education. Um, and, and so I was lucky enough in my early years to curate a show that hi highlighted the rise of weaving from one woman to like literally hundreds of women and men weaving. And like traditionally uh, men were carvers and women wove, but those lines have blurred because I tried to weave when I was young and I actually am allergic to red cedar and yellow cedar, really bomb Haida. Um, but I, I tattoo and I do art and curate exhibitions and, and you'll see, you know, Todd is a man who weaves. And so those lines have been blurred where you get women who carve and tattoo or whatever, and like men who, who weave. And I think that's a really cool time in our history to like celebrate, but I do have like a number of um, images green um, and I just want to talk about them and kind of give you a sense of like the different styles of weaving because we have four main different styles and there's um, uh, there's cedar bark which we we're predominantly talking about today. There's spruce root where we actually go out and dig up the roots and then roast them and then split them down and weave them. There's chilcat which is our highest level, I think, of weaving because it takes, you know, upwards of three years to create one robe. Like it's a really complex weaving style. And then there's Raven's Tail, which is also very complex, but it's geom geometric, whereas uh, the Chilcat style is, um, uh, you know, a little, little more uh, figurative. But um, I, if, if we can share um, the your with the, the, here we go. So this is a really quick glance at the work that I do. And this is like the Hide Now exhibit. And this is for all of those, all of you. So my hope is, is that if you are in the Lower Mainland, you check it out because it's gonna be closing in July. And then, uh, um, and for those of you who are far away, at least this is like a quick glimpse and we'll be releasing a, a virtual tour of this. And I do talk about weaving quite a bit in it. So there's seven different galleries and there's over 450 works in this exhibition that highlight a variety of stories. And um, it was quite remarkable uh, to work with the Vancouver uh, Museum of Vancouver because they have a huge weaving collection from throughout the entire Northwest Coast. So I actually invited a number of weaving experts to come through to uh, help me identify features of the weaving. And uh, this is the main weaving gallery. So this particular gallery that you see is called like in the home. So it's like everything to do with like a like a home and like a lot of these baskets are are predominantly uh, spruce root, but if you look closely in the first case to the right, there's these robes and they're actually made from cedar bark. So the cedar bark was processed and uh, beaten down and they actually included nettle fiber in it. So it was quite soft. So we had, uh, it, it's incredible the malleable, like how malleable cedar can be and like what you can do with it uh, when, when you treat it properly. And so these were actually um, 
capes that were made um, and they, they had uh, fur collars on them. They're quite classy, um, but they, they're also waterproof if they're done properly. So it's, it's quite a beautiful technology and the, the cedar bark itself actually um, deterred from, from like the toxin in, in cedar uh, deters like insects and anything. So it's, it's quite, um, it'll last a long time. Um, <clears throat> and so this is just a glimpse of, of what the Haida Now exhibit looks like. Um, and kind of what I specialize in as a curator is, is to find some of the finest human expressions that I can find in my lifetime and present them to a wider cross section of people so that there's like a, a stronger understanding of the sophistication and the beauty of indigenous culture. Um, <clears throat> so you'll see here, that these are masters and you'll see there's a hat uh, in, the, in the far right of the image. And that's the, the image that Kung Jade was talking about. So in my lifetime, I always dreamed to see this hat and it was extraordinary when I put together this project that it sat on my desk for most of the time that I put this project together. Um, and I have another photo of it uh, coming up down the road. So um, here are the finest weavings we could find in the entire collection. I think there's about 50 different weavings. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I worked with uh, weaving experts to identify uh, what was Haida and what wasn't, and like even go as far as to identifying all the different various uh, patterns on each of the baskets and hats. Uh, you know, every uh, weaver has a signature and every basket has a story to tell. So all of the, the emblems that you see, they're geometric, but they actually uh, represent um, the uh, natural elements of the, the world. Um, so you'll get the flight path of a dragonfly, or you'll get the wind patterns, or you'll get um, the shadow of a tree. Um, there's like a butterfly, uh, there's waves, there's like flying geese. So every detail that you see actually has a story to tell. Um, and every weaver has a signature. So even today I can walk through a potlatch and um, I can identify the weaver across the room because it's that type of fashion that we carry still today through you know, Selena and her family. To, to be able to, to um, kind of decipher how we communicate. And so as Haida, we um, understand that 90% of all communication is nonverbal and it really shows through our culture and our art. So these baskets kind of tell stories um, and, and kind of vivid imagery to kind of express, I guess, just like any fashion today of who we are and where we come from. So you can move, move on. This is just a station for kids to draw and be a part of the exhibit, which I, I, I was quite proud of. But can, um, here's a living room. Haida's are very good at visiting. That's, I think, what brought us through smallpox. And so it's important to create a living room space where people could just visit and enjoy uh, each other and communicate, because I think we need that more and more, especially with our digital era that we live in. Here's a margillite. There's 125 pieces in this one uh, case. It's a pretty spectacular collection. I'm gonna keep going. This is just the end of the exhibit. So the whole thing about Haida now is to explain that we're still here. Um, and we, we got this like vivid effort, collective effort of Haida's coming together to express, nourish and grow our culture. Um, so this whole room was dedicated to uh, resistance, resilience, and reconciliation. These are pole fragments that were cut out of totem poles, and they sit in the middle of resistance, resilience, and reconciliation. And these will be returning to Haida Gwaii um, when the exhibition is done. So a number of pieces will be repatriated back to the Haida once this exhibition is over in July. This is a wall, so it's like, what does reconciliation mean to you? So it's just the analog crowdsourcing conversation. 
I don't think they have it now because of COVID, but there's a, you can do a digital uh, response too. And then, so if you keep going, this is just the end. This is just the final piece. I thought that screen would be great for uh, people taking selfies and then uh, putting them up on the digital wall. <clears throat> uh, and then there's the other photos, which we'll go through quickly. I have about five minutes left to talk, but there's some really great examples that I wanted to share with you. I tried to put them in order, but I am not that inept in putting together presentations. So Jorge has um, uh, a few more photos that I wanted to share. And they're, they're all artists that I've worked with um, over my 14 year career. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I'm, I'm hoping that this just, oh, well, so here's the poster for Haida now and here are the pieces here. That one large hat that you see with the killer whale on it with the green painted, that's two feet across. And that particular hat, we had a medium come in and channel to the ancestors and it was used for um, uh, every royal family because most of the Haida had the Nang Ito Haida Gas, which is like the high ranking people. And they say the proportion of high ranking Haidas was more than commoners or slaves. So um, the, uh, that particular hat was uh, developed for the family comedian because winters became quite long. So just like a royal court would have a jester, that type of hat was for, for that. And I thought it was quite spectacular because it works as like a megaphone. And I imagine like a hilarious skinny cousin with lots of hilarious jokes wearing it in this massive hat. So, but these are the, the hats that are included into the Hide and Now exhibit. And this is Isabel Rorick and her sister Merle Williams, um, who we worked with quite extensively. And if you're curious about them, we actually did a video with them talking about these pieces. Um, and it's called Woven Beauty, and you can find it on the, the Museum of Vancouver website. Uh, it's quite a beautiful short clip. It's only about five minutes. Um, <clears throat> so I recommend that. And here is Isabel's hat herself. She is the, today's master weaver, but this is spruce root. Um, but cedar bark, you can get as fine to this too. But uh, uh, I, I uh, really... Uh, encourage you to look at the stitches because each stitch means something. And when the ladies make these hats or when weavers make these hats, they don't necessarily always have a form. So there's like a disc and then they weave the top and then weave down and it's all pure mathematics to get it to the symmetry that you see right there. Here are uh, the examples from Haida now and the, the hat with the raven on the top uh, was quite striking and I wanted to include it in this. That particular hat is done by Marlene Little, who I believe is Kumjade's family. Um, and she's included metal into it. And then also on the top, I think this is a really important thing is that artists collaborate. So um, probably her you know, male relative carved the raven piece on the top and then she wove the rest and those, like I think weaving has been quite powerful in bringing together uh, those energies to collaborate, to make beautiful pieces like this. This is cool. This is like a mat, uh, the, the flat mat with the black on it is uh, in, from Montreal. And then the folded up basket that you see um, is from the American Museum of Natural History. And I took both of these photos because I've worked with both of those, uh, like the McCord Museum and the American Museum of Natural History. So I, I thought these were great examples to kind of support Todd's like cedar bark weaving. Uh, that finish is very difficult from my understanding. I know we have a piece like that at the Haida Gwaii Museum and it has a finish uh, just like that, and many uh, weavers have come in uh, during my time there to study that finish. But the basket's interesting because cedar bark is so malleable that this was like a cargo basket. So the Haida would make them, they would wet them, and then uh, fold them up. And then when it was time to fill them with potatoes or other things, um, they would re-wet them and then reshape them and fill them with cargo. So it was, I thought it was like, what a beautiful, uh, kind of technology. And then the, the next one, 
oh, this is just a great shot. Uh, this is from Skitty Get, and that's a really classical uh, Haida weave. And when you see that, those uh, cylinders, we call them skill. It's like the, just the black lines. Those are like a form of measurement, uh, which I thought was quite clever, but it's, the, it's really unique to like Haida style is that particular type of weave. So next one. This is a photo of Megan O'Brien. She's a good friend of mine. She is a, um, a, a very talented Chilkat weaver. Um, and she remade an old robe uh, or an old apron and her and her teacher are actually cutting it off the loom. So this is a Chilkat style weaving, which is includes cedar bark. So yellow cedar is at the base of the wool of the, the warp. And then the weft is um, mountain goat wool and merino wool. But uh, I thought this was a good example to show that it's not loom woven, it's just free hanging. And uh, Chilkat, this particular style of weaving is the only kind of weaving in the world that um, uh, makes a perfect circle, which is quite interesting. Anyways, next one. This is uh, our other style of weaving. This is Raven's Tail. It's a, they call it Northern geometric style. And just like all of our weaving, everything always has a meaning. So every kind of motif you see within that has a story to tell. And that's by master um, weaver Evelyn Vanderhoop, who is the granddaughter of Selena Pradovich. And then the, the next one. This is a more modern example. So the unique thing about the Raven's Tail weaving, which is the geometric robe that you see, is that there is only 14 examples in the world. Uh, 12 were uh, old robes that were found in museums and two were images. And this essentially was a dormant style weaving and it came back through Dolores Churchill and a lady named Cheryl Samuel and a couple other ladies from the North and I don't remember their names. But you also see like the beauty. I also wanted to include uh, Lisa Telford's dress which we used in Time Warp in 2011. It, um, as another extraordinary example of what can what a weaver can do with this type of weaving. Next one. I wanted to show this this because this is like an exciting image because I put this hat on. I'm not sure if I was allowed to do that, but I did anyways. And that was in the Hide and Now collection. But I really like the photo, and you can see me in the front, um, just to see all of the weaving that is being worn and. Uh, our weavers have essentially dressed our Paul Atches to like when I was a little girl, you'd see one or two hats and now it's just like a sea, an ocean of weaving, which is quite beautiful. Uh, next one. Is that it? Oh, okay. And here, they're not cedar bark, but they're, they're all related. They're all relative. And you'll see, I have my good friend Brody here. He's the grandson of Charles Eden Shaw. He's a relative of Kung Jade. And he's got his tattoo, which is Charles Eden Shaw's um, signature. And then uh, you also see it on the hat. So it's nice that we can have that continuum uh, there. So ne next one. Is that it? I think, well, I think that's like enough. I think it's time for Todd to uh, kind of uh, share with us and I look forward to your questions after. So uh, thank you for your time and uh, here's Todd. Um, thank you so much. Um, how uh, Kuiwa, I just wanted to say um, thank you so much for all your hard work and bringing all this work to life so that everyone can enjoy it um, here in the beautiful city of Vancouver. Um, uh, I'm so in awe of you and your hard work and the beautiful creations that you make. Um, uh, and I just want to open up the floor for you to share uh, some of your work with us. How are? 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 How
on Iski on uh, Vancouver Public Library, Hada Lassus. Um, and thank you for inviting me here. Uh, Hiskiga Hinudiki Ang. Uh, my name in Haida is Hiskiga. And uh, in English, my name is Todd. That was the name I was first given. So uh, basically, I want to give you a little overview of what I do. And I'm a Haida weaver. I weave uh, cedar bark, uh, western red cedar bark. Um, I don't do any of the other three kinds of weaving. Uh, I wouldn't say I do it yet, but I may be doing it. But right now, my uh, first love is uh, working with uh, western red cedar bark. Um, I live in Vancouver on the unceded territories of the Coast Salish, the Squamish, the Tsleil-Waututh, and the Musqueam. And um, I'm from Old Masset. I'm from the Chichkidene clan. And um, I've been living here now in Vancouver since um, what, 2010. So uh, what led me? Well, <clears throat> I started weaving a little late, late in life. And uh, I found I was part of the 60 scoop. And so I was taken away as a young child at the age of two and placed into foster care and then moved around for a couple of times until I was adopted at the age of nine and received my uh, surname, DeVries. There um, took a long time for me to find my mom, but in 1996, I finally found my mom. I wrote a little letter to the government of, uh, government of Canada uh, demanding they look into my file in terms of some status. And sure enough, yeah, I'm status. I'm a status Indian. So, uh, and I'm Haida. Okay, so um, uh, when I met my mom um, and uh, other Haidas, there's, there's a lot of Haida art um, amongst us, like uh, Kuiwa was showing all that all that fantastical art that we do. And um, okay, so I had to figure out uh, how am I gonna express myself as a Haida? And um, one, of the, one of the prerequisites to carving, because a lot of men are carving, is to be able to illustrate or draw. And um, I get headaches drawing and it's a, it's a real pain, you know, I don't know. I can't seem to draw, so I guess I can't carve. And those two, uh, painting and drawing, are really big. And I kind of left with weaving. I don't know anything about weaving. And then um, one day, I got to tell you this. Um, I'm in Winlaw, BC, um, taking care of the estate of a, a doctor, uh, Carolyn DeMarco, while she was uh, doing her doctoring in Toronto. And so I'm um, uh, taking care of her garden, you know, taking care of the yard, being a, a good uh, house sitter. Uh, she uh, let me sit in the cab cabin in the back 40. And um, there, when, uh, one evening, I'm going to stoke the little, uh, the little wood stove because it's getting a little chilly at night, about five o'clock. And in the window, you know, I'm looking out at the garden and it goes all silver on me like uh, one of those silver embossed paintings. And there's these trees, there's a path, and there's this woman standing at a fork in the path, kind of looking at me. An old woman. And, and uh, I go, oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> that's unusual. Uh, can't see the garden around her, you know. Say, hey, what's your name? What you doing here, you know? <laughs> Good to see you. Uh, are you real? <laughs> kind of look outside the door, you know, go outside the door here, check outside, is the garden still there? Yep, garden still there. Look back at the window, uh, and she's still there. So uh, I, I, I was brought up um, in a Dutch Christian reform household. And um, so when you're in the presence of something sacred, you, you bow your head. So I bowed my head just for a couple seconds, you know, and it's like, okay, uh, I look back up 
and she was gone. The garden was back. So I said, okay, what does that mean? What does that mean? So I phoned up uh, the uh, museum there in Skidigate. And um, I was talking to Nika Collison, and she said, um, that's a dream for you to figure out. Wow, wow, OK. Um, the internet was just born. 1999, I had this, this vision. And so uh, I um, jumped on the internet, typed in the search words, uh, old woman of the forest story, Native American. Sure enough, the New Chalinas had a story on Vancouver Island. And they said that if you ever encountered the old woman of the forest and you live to tell the tale, you'll be given the gift to teach weaving. Uh, excuse me, uh, I don't know about this, you know, because I don't know anything about weaving. So how can I even teach it? You know, I don't even know how to do it. I know a lot of people know how to do it, don't know how to teach, but there are teachers. So I went to the, what, the Nelson Public Library at the time and looked up uh, Cedar, the Tree of Life by Hilary Stewart. And then um, looked for ways to harvest cedar. And in that book, she shows you how to harvest cedar. So then I went up uh, Give Out Creek up uh, Silver King Mountain behind uh, Nelson there, Silver King, um, Silver King Road, and walked up to the three mile mark. And then um, I noticed there's a little path up the, up, up the mountain a little bit, just going off the main road, like a little uh, skid path for loggers to you know, slide the logs down. So, okay, this looks really good. You know, it doesn't look like it's active or anything. So, hey, I can get off the main road if I'm going to be harvesting any bark and I don't want to draw attention at the moment because I really don't know what I'm doing yet. So I... I go about a hundred yards in and I look back and then I got that vision again. The whole forest went silver. And then I realized who the old woman of the forest was. And that's what kind of got me to start weaving that vision. And so I've been, I've started practicing for many years and it wasn't until um, 2008, I think I met my first teacher, Terry Russ. She showed me how to, ha uh, how to harvest and cut the bark. And then my second teacher was Sherry Dick. Um, she showed me how to make my first hat. And then in 2010, just before I came to Vancouver, I went and visited Holly Churchill in Ketchikan, where she was living at the time, Alaska. We were only supposed to be there for about 10 days. And we ended up being there for about almost four weeks because the ferry kept on getting delayed. But while I was there, I was able to learn from her uh, traditional stories about weaving, learned a lot of weaving techniques, a lot of Heidi signatures. And um, she showed me um, how I can um, make my career as a weaver. And so I'm really grateful to know that um, she is in line with uh, um, Dolores Churchill and Selena Petrovich, so I'm learning from the best. And uh, when I came to Vancouver in, in March, um, I didn't start teaching right away. First, I started building my network and um, I got a studio and I was working at a restaurant for six years and then I finally started teaching full-time in 2016. So what do I teach, right? Yeah, so I teach how to do weaving. And one of the first things we learn is how to make a spider, okay? And this kind of looks like a spider, but I'm turning it into a star because everything we need to know about weaving, we learn from the spider, okay? And um, so we make headband. I teach people how to make headbands, spiders, which is the basics to a, um, a hat, like the one I'm ma making. I got several hats on the go here. I'm even teaching those at um, a workshop here at Britannia for seniors every Thursday. And we do, uh, we, I teach about 30 seniors 
that are of uh, Aboriginal descent or um, their partners are Aboriginal and they want to learn and get involved in the culture. So we, I teach people how to make fedoras, how to make um, traditional hat forms. And yes, I have a very unique signature. So if you look very, very closely at this beginning here, you have uh, a very different uh, signature than you find the ones in the museum. I will not copy those in the museum because those are not my signatures. But I do ask my students to use that signature until they figure out their own. So where, because COVID, I'm teaching everything online now. I used to teach everything in person. But if you really want to follow me around and uh, you're interested in maybe a Zoom instruction, yeah, you can follow me at my website there. And um, it's uh, eskilgablogspot.blogspot.ca. And there I have uh, a bunch of projects that um, I teach. So one of the more popular projects I teach is how to make Okay, I'm gonna switch cam. I'm gonna add a camera view here. Because I this is my phone in front of me. And I, this is kind of my setup I use for what I'm teaching. So when I turn on my phone, you'll see my hands beside me. And so I've been teaching people how to weave with uh, cedar bark. And here's a kit on how to weave a friendship bracelet, basically how to make rope and in the Devil's Club bead for protection. And I also show people how to make mats and headbands. Another popular kit around Christmas is the reindeer kit. And if you're really into making table mats, I got it in a kit for one of those. Headband kits and round basket kits, spider kits. I'm happy to show you. I figured my um, mandate is uh, not to give you a hat, but to give you the skills to make your own hat. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm, I'm really happy to be here and meet you all. Thanks again, how are? Thank you so much, uh, Todd, for joining us and for sharing all that knowledge. Uh, so I'm gonna ask uh, everyone on the panel to join us because we're going to Take some questions. We have about seven or eight minutes left before 1 p.m. And so I know a lot of people in the in the chat um, are very interested in what they've seen. So if anyone has any questions and you want to pop them into the chat, we'll be able to to chat about them. Um, let us know. I'll wait for a sec. I guess people are just mesmerized by what they saw. They don't have questions yet. We'll wait for a second. In the meantime, Todd, I was going to ask you, how many students do you usually get in some of your classes when you're teaching? You're muted. I can't hear you. Sorry. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> OK, um, I have um, uh, an artist in res. I'm an artist in residence at uh, Britannia Community Center, and I have two classes there, one on Wednesday afternoons and one on Thursday afternoons. Yeah. Thursday afternoons, um we do the hats and that's where um i have up to 15 students at a time oh. and we do about 30 throughout the year so we, we break it up into two groups and then um on the wednesday group we have up to 20 but when we're doing it in person we had up to 40 people join in the um the weaving uh workshops so I'm and then add... i also do yeah. oh, I have a, a question about that that someone asked in the chat. Barbara is asking if you find that something is lost that when you're teaching on Zoom versus teaching in person. Um, no, actually, because uh, what I find is I can use my background here. I can uh, switch it so I can give you different pictures. So right now you just see my, my you know, my drab white wall in my basement there. But I can also change it so that you can see um what i do and where i am so this is what trees look like here in vancouver when they when they've been um 
when they've been harvested. Oh, wow. Oh, this cool. is what they call a culturally modified tree. And so, yeah. Amazing. Can you show us, uh, can you, actually, can you move so we can see the bark? I, someone was asking a very interesting question that I think is relevant to what you're just showing us, which is, um, is there a protocol for har harvesting the red cedar to make sure not too much is harvested or to protect the trees? That, um, can you speak a little bit to that? Cynthia was asking this. Yes, there, there is. I'll uh, be putting out um, a video uh, a little bit more in depth next year on um, harvesting cedar bark. Um, when, when, when we walk into a forest, you want to honor, honor all the beings that are there. And um, so you, you, you want to walk, um, tread lightly, because um, you don't want to um, stress out the inhabitants. And that includes the trees. So with the trees, you're looking at a tree like you're looking at a person in a tree body. And so when we go to a tree, we talk to that tree like it's a person. Uh, look at me, look at me, long life maker. I've come to take a bit of your dress. Please do not be angry with me. I'm going to be um, taking just a little bit of your bark and teaching other people how uh, to reach, how to weave um, hats, headbands, bracelets, and, and others, how a, how a long life maker. And then I give a gift. And sometimes the most traditional gift is um, a little tobacco, um, a song, I, or some people use tea, some people even use coffee, anything that doesn't attract wildlife. And that uh, the tree, you know, what you're giving up is uh, being um, accepted. And then when you go harvest that tree, you take a little hatchet, in the past, we used um, rocks, uh, sharp rocks, or even uh, sharp, sharp shells. And you would just cut a little, little strip there at the bottom. Move my camera out a little bit. Tiny little strip back here. And then you get your fingers underneath it. And then you start walking and you're pulling it away. And you only want to take about two or three strips from the tree. Because otherwise you're going to stress the tree out and it won't be able to draw as much water and it'll have a hard time um, producing all the sugars it needs and all the stuff to make it live when you remove all the bark. So you don't want to wring the tree. So you, you only take a little strip off. So it's only when the tree is felled, cut down, do you take all the bark off. Okay. Thank you for sharing. Um, I think you covered two or three questions in the chat. Now I'm going to ask a question to Kui. Uh, and there's someone, Janet is asking us, uh, can you speak more about the repatriation of items to the Haydn Nation from the Mo Museum of Vancouver and from other museums and collections? Um, okay, that's a long story, but I can do the elevator pitch. Um, there is, uh, has been a, a several decade effort amongst the Haida to repatriate our ancestors first and foremost. We have um, repatriated over 600 ancestors from around the world and now we're in phase two because we've identified most of our ancestors in museums and institutions um, that have been taken and put into museum collections. So phase two is like looking for our treasures. Um, so when I worked with the little collection, I said, I will work with you as long as you give stuff back to us. And they're like, oh yeah, for sure. So um, they actually repatriated um, two poles and I think about 10 items and that were sacred that couldn't even go on display um, uh, in 29th show is over. Uh, we'll be consulting with the community to see what else we want to bring back. And so the idea is, is that we build these relationships with these post-colonial institutions to um, create good relationships so we can get our stuff back in goodwill and with respect. And like, if they want to borrow it, they can't. So, um, but the thing is, is that there's over, I think, 12 to 13,000 items out there in the world. So, 
um, what the Hyder donor is essentially sifting through all this, and we essentially want the best pieces back. So there's an effort now amongst the Haida community to uh, make sure that that happens. Um, and the Museum of Vancouver kind of kicked in the door by just saying, hey, we're going to give you this stuff back. Whereas, like, I think it's only been twice in our history that people have actually offered to give stuff back outside of like a, in a institution, you know, like, you know, private uh, collectors will give stuff back, no problem. But uh, the Museum of Vancouver is like one of two institutions that has like voluntarily said, hey, you should take these things back. We think so that's kind of that that story there and so it's like a new era kind of right and I always tease my museum friends because I'm a museum nerd too and I call them a bunch of pirates and that we live in stagnant pirate ships but um <laughs> that's another story but a lot of the repatriation is coming through people like Todd who actually study collections so it's not necessarily a repatriation of um object patriation they come in study and replicate pieces so that's because there's that intellectual repatriation that other people have also there's a question thank you for that um i i want to yeah. talk specifically about other questions pieces that you talked about um there, there's a question that I think applies to both Todd and, and Kui, which is about how the artists get designs onto the hats. So we saw all these beautiful hats with gorgeous designs. Uh, we saw them in the images, Todd, you, you showed us um, your weaving, but there, people are wondering how, how you get the designs onto the hats and what kind of paints are, are used. Um, some of the hats, like this one here, but I have a beaded, um headband hat band put in uh, other hats like this one i'm just currently working on it has um some black material that's not cedar bark it's uh, wool that i wove just one line in and so you can add in different materials of different colors to change the colors but you, a lot of the uh, designs themselves um the painted they're painted designs, and I think they use acrylic for that, but I'm not 100% sure because I haven't, I'm not one of those painters and I probably missed the, uh, the actual name of the paint. But um, yeah, they used to use uh, berries, uh, different um, um, mixtures back in the day, and I don't know what those are either. I'm learning traditional dyes, so you can dye the whole bark um red or black without using chemical dyes um, but most of the time you're adding in material or you're painting it on the material or using the material itself to create the patterns so um i think we're running out of time so i'm going to invite kung Jade to come back and join us and um i'm going to say thank you all for being here and i'm going to let kung Jade wrap this up You are muted currently, Kunjade. The Lung Watlabun Ash Kate Lakang. I thank each and every one of you for being here. The Lung the Lung Watlawan the Lung Di Koyadang. I love each and every one of you. The Lung Di Koyadang. I love you all forever. I am so